pretty much unheard of to say, oh, you're going to have one administration of a medication and it's in your system for you know, several hours. It's out of your system in a day. But six months later, a year later, we're going to probe and we're going to see it, it's still affecting your behavior in a positive way. I've heard it numerous times that including from patients who have been in therapy for years or even decades and say, this is like years of therapy, you know, in an afternoon. Welcome to the world as you'll know it. I'm your host, Judith Warner. This season, we're focusing on the brain. Specifically, we're looking at some of the most recent and astonishing advancements in brain science, discoveries that have completely altered our understanding of how the brain works what it's capable of, and how it can be changed. Today, a bit paradoxically, we're looking at substances that have been in use for millennia, psychedelics. Their ability to transform, sometimes radically, the way people see the world is mythic. And about 70 years ago, psychedelics were heralded as a possible answer to many of society's most entrenched problems, being studied as potential treatments for issues like depression and alcoholism. And then, all that stopped. The 60s happened. The language around psychedelics became all about fear. Funding went away, and research came to a halt. But today they're back, with a fair bit of hype and a lot of renewed hope, based on some really solid science. Joining us to talk about what this means is Dr. Matthew Johnson, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Johns Hopkins University. As a member of the Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, he's been on the front lines of psychedelic research for almost 20 years and has pioneered using psilocybin, magic mushrooms, to treat addiction. Welcome, Matt. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, Judy. My pleasure. So it seems like we're on the cusp or even in the midst of a whole new era of psychedelic research. And there's a lot to cover, history and science and regulation, But first, I'd love to know what drew you to this field. I really just fell in love with this broader area of psychopharmacology, how drugs affect the brain, the mind, behavior. I mean, whether it's caffeine, you know, alcohol, illicit drugs, you know, therapeutic drugs or, you know, so-called, you know, drugs of addiction or of abuse. It's all, it was all just very fascinating. And I discovered that academic world, did some rat research with cocaine when I was in college. But I came across this history doing some, you know, a paper on the use of psychedelics therapeutically back in the 60s and, and really figured out that, oh, wow, this, the rug was pulled out, not because we sort of concluded that there was no future, but more because it kind of got out of the lab and there was this political reaction to it. And, you know, gosh, I'm ultimately interested in drugs and behavior. And I just don't know of another drug class where you have examples of people saying that they did this drug one time, sometimes like 30, 40, 50 years ago, and they say it changed their life for the better. Exactly. What are these substances with these magical powers? How how do you define them? Psychedelics is a very general term. And I think that the most meaningful definition is a drug that has strong effects in altering someone's perception of reality, including their perception of themselves. Now, once we delve into the, like, how that is happening in the brain, you have one class called the classic psychedelics, and that includes LSD and psilocybin mushrooms and DMT, which is in ayahuasca, and mescaline, which is in peyote. Those all work by mimicking serotonin at a particular type of serotonin receptors. And then you have other drugs like MDMA, that's not a classic psychedelic, but it's still called a psychedelic in that more general sense. And it it kind of floods the system with, with natural serotonin. So you mentioned a bit earlier the use of psychedelics back in the early 60s when the rug was pulled out from lots of research being done. What were those studies looking at? What drugs were being tested? It was primarily LSD. The compound that was second most prevalent was mescaline. So interestingly, not psilocybin, which is the main a classic psychedelic under clinical investigation today. But the two leading therapeutic areas of research were treating cancer patients. And these were terminal cancer patients who had substantial anxiety. Um, you can call it existential distress uh, about their, their coming death. Not, so not trying to treat the cancer itself, you know, prevent the tumors from coming back and this type of thing, but helping the person essentially to come to peace with the fact that 
they're going to die and to alleviate a lot of that suffering that can come at those times. The other um, was the use of, of these psychedelics to treat alcoholism. It would appear that the results, just from the, the, the few randomized studies, I mean, it looked as good as anything we have today in terms of a medication. And so then fast forward to today, you said that psilocybin is now the main drug being studied. Is it picking up where those other drugs left off in, in terms of what it's being used to treat? The most rigorous evidence to date, if we're talking about psilocybin, is in the treatment of, of you know, cancer patients with end-of-life distress, so showing large improvements in, in depression and anxiety symptoms. And so the reason I say it's the most rigorous body of evidence is that there's been three um, independent randomized clinical trials, including one that I and, and colleagues ran at Hopkins. And they just showed from a single high-dose session – very large reductions in both depression and anxiety symptoms that looked virtually untouched six months later. And that's, the, I would say, the paradigm shifting aspect of this. In, in other words, what's really different? What's the new thing about this treatment? We think about mental health psychiatric meds. It's, you know, you take a pill every day and it reduces symptoms and you keep taking it and hopefully you keep getting relief. Um, it's pretty much unheard of to say, oh, you're going to have one administration of a medication you know, it's in your system for you know, several hours. It's out of your system in a day. But six months later, a year later, we're going to probe and we're going to see it's that experience or having you know, had that drug, it's still affecting your behavior in a positive way. What is, what's the uniqueness that makes that incredible uh, effect happen? This is still actively being debated and researched, but I think the answer is that psychedelics work by allowing an experience to unfold and people learn from that experience. And so that makes it more like a psychotherapy or I would say more broadly, a life experience. Someone could say, oh, there was that the first time I fell in love or when I became a parent or the first time I visited another culture and really felt, you know, felt what it was like to be in the minority. Just some, some things in your life you can point to and there was a shift there. This is more in that category. And this is still in the area of emerging research, but it may be and appears to be that the brain is more plastic. It's more able to absorb new information, to be more flexible and, and potentially make long-term changes in the days following that experience. So you might have kind of a double whammy, this kind of perfect opportunity for alternative perspective taking to, to have this broader view of the world outside of your normal constraints, narrowed perspectives, and then combined with this neuroplasticity, this kind of this increased ability of the brain to learn something from the experience and make it a permanent change. It's like psychotherapy on steroids. When it works well, and it doesn't always work well, and no treatment always works. I've heard it numerous times that, including from patients who have been in therapy for years or even decades and say, this is like years of therapy, you know, in an afternoon. Now that is overstating a little bit because all these folks have had all the preparation, you know, you know, four to eight hours and previous meetings developing a rapport, but nonetheless, still a pretty discreet short-term intervention that people say is like doing years of therapy. Can you walk us through what it looks like in your lab, let's say, when somebody is in a study and is coming in for treatment, just with the preparation, the guides, all of that? The first phase is really important. It's the screening. And so someone might spend, uh, you know, typically um, two half days in the lab, filling out questionnaires, going through a physical, you taking their blood and looking at their liver enzymes and all that stuff, but also taking structured psychiatric screening. And you're really probing for something. Is there some sort of um, propensity for disorders like schizophrenia? When someone passes all of those uh, medical psychiatric screenings, and if they participate in the study, then there's the preparation phase. So this is, depending on the study, anywhere from four to eight hours of preparation. For my work where we're treating people to, to quit smoking with psilocybin, it includes both specific preparation for the psilocybin sessions as well as preparation for quitting smoking, sort of this talk therapy that's a little more standard for anyone uh, who's quitting smoking. The most important aspect of that is really the rapport building. It's not telling them one thing or another about the psilocybin experiences they might have, but 
It's getting used to the human beings, and it's typically two, and we often call them guides, the people who will be there in that therapeutic role when you're in the room, when when you're on psilocybin, they'll be there. If you have some anxiety, that's going to be the person to hold your hand and, and reassure you that you're being kept safe. Um, so that relationship is key. Are they psychologists? It varies. They could be a, a psychologist. They could be a social worker. I think as these things become considered as treatments by the FDA, then we're going to get more of the territory where there's going to be some type of regulation in terms of what type of degree the person has to have, what type of licensure the person has to have. So then what happens, let's say, the day of, the day of treatment? For the smoking research, that's also the first sessions of the day where they're going to be quitting smoking. So that's a double whammy in terms of being a big day, right? But for any psilocybin session, it's a, it's a big day. So on that day, they come in early in the morning, do some minimal questionnaires, check in to see how the person's doing, check their blood pressure, but then pretty much get to it. They swallow a, a pill, the session room that they've, they've been exposed to before, the preparation sessions, at least some of them have happened in this room, so that's not new. And it will take anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes for it to kick in, typically. During that time, we can engage in some discussion. There's some art books they can look through. And music is playing during this entire time and during the whole experience. And once the person starts to feel an effect, that's when we invite them to lay down on the couch rather than sitting up. And then we put eye shades on them, have them listen to headphones through which this, you know, already selected, you know, course of music is playing. And then they're really encouraged to have an inward experience. Don't worry about us. Don't worry about the room. Just focus on your inner experience and try not to overanalyze it. How long does it generally last, the trip? Five to six hours. And and then what happens? They come down and that's a gradual process and they are sort of feeling pretty much back to normal about six hours later, they often feel exhausted. So not normal per se, but they're no longer experiencing the psilocybin effects. They're experiencing the aftermath, the exhaustion, if anything, and the potential contemplation of this very, very different experience. And so what we do is we send them home with a loved one. Traditionally, we'd invite the person into the room for 10 minutes to kind of sit down, the the family member or the loved one, the friend taking them home to kind of have a gentle, you know, handoff uh, and sort of let that person see, you know, the environment the person was in for the day. And then when do they start to digest it with you? And what does that look like, sound like? There's a a typically a meeting the very next day um, called an integration meeting. And that just is a discussion of the experience. The biggest technique is just what could be called supportive therapy. It's like, you know, reflective listening, taking the person seriously, but you know, the, it's not like the guide or the therapist has any, this sort of like dream interpretation, you know, kind of these mystical answers. Oh, well, you had an experience uh, where you had a vision of an eagle that symbolizes this or that, you know, it's like nothing like that. It's just processing, helping the person sort through, come to their own meaning from it. How many people, you know, have you studied and what's the percentage rate of success that you've had? So for helping people quit smoking, at this point, across the studies uh, in the laboratory research, over 100 uh, now. And then in other studies across many studies, gosh, it's uh, hundreds. I mean, I think well over 500, you know, folks uh, through Hopkins over the years in the various studies. Our small pilot study had a very high success rate of 80% smoke-free, and that's biologically confirmed. We confirm that by looking at their breath samples and their urine samples that can tell us if they've been smoking. Um, But 80% at six months, and that held up to 67% a a year later, so a year after the target quit date. So those are very high success rates. Six months later, even, you, you typically only get success rates in the 20s or 30s for the best medications. You've described the effect on the brain as like shaking a snow globe. What do these drugs do to the brain that allows something so major to happen so fast? Yeah, and this is an area that's really complex and we can speak about different levels. We know that that a drug like psilocybin hits a certain type of serotonin receptor, a brain receptor that normally receive serotonin the way a lock would receive a key. But instead of serotonin fitting into that receptor, now psilocybin is kind of mimicking uh, serotonin fitting into that keyhole. 
but then it's affecting the brain and the cell, the neuron and the brain in a very different way. Obviously, serotonin itself, which is floating through our heads right now, is not psychedelic. So it affects the system in a different way. It seems like there is an overall increase in the connectivity across the brain. What that means is areas of the brain that don't normally jive with each other, now they're moving and grooving with each other. There's a correlation between their activity instead of it just being kind of independent. You talked about plasticity. You know that plasticity is playing a role here. Is the plasticity greater with psilocybin treatment or other psychedelic treatment? And why is that exactly? So we know in rats that different forms of the neuroplasticity unfold. And what that means is it can mean branching of, of neurons, brain cells, growing of branches, like just like a tree would grow branches. And those are the things that could potentially um, form connections with other neurons. We also know that synaptogenesis happens, and that refers to that, those forming of new connections with those various branches. Some evidence suggesting perhaps neurogenesis, which is actually the birth of new neurons. There's many forms of neuroplasticity. And so it does seem clear that at least in some of these forms of neuroplasticity that these psychedelics have powerful effects. We do not know whether those are unfolding in people. It's a very good bet, I think, that they are. And we don't know whether that is underlying and responsible for some of the therapeutic effects. So that's at the horizon. Your colleague, Roland Griffiths, who has been a really big deal in psychedelics research for a really long time, in 2020 wrote something really striking. And he said, recent popular press books, websites, podcasts, and media reports have uncritically promoted presumed benefits of psychedelics. Patient demand is growing, as is the interest in the general population, with the possibility that expectations are outpacing the current data on what outcomes can be confidently foreseen. I mean, that's two years ago, and things are changing really fast. But do you agree with that? I mean, are we in some ways getting ahead of ourselves with our expectations or getting ahead of ourselves in terms of the science? That's uh, Yes, there's a lot of hype around psychedelics, and we should follow the FDA pathway in terms of really evaluating its regulation as a medicine. The, the definitive phase three studies haven't been done. That said, uh, this is a really complex area. But Roland's also, and we disagree about these things. I mean, he said a number of times he thinks psychedelics can save humanity. And I just, I just, to me, that's one of the examples of what went wrong in the 60s that, you know, that that generation, they really dropped the ball. Um, a lot of people are doing important work to save humanity and psychedelics hopefully can play a role in mental health care, but I think this kind of over bloated expectations about transforming the future of humanity are, that's where we start to get into really troubled territory. And so getting the FDA on board with evaluating these drugs, which it now is, seems like a pretty critical piece of the puzzle in terms of tamping down that hype. So where are we with that? What drugs is the FDA looking at now and and which ones might be approved the soonest? Yeah, so the most advanced research is being done with MDMA for treating PTSD. So one out of two FDA studies have been conducted and that work looks really promising in terms of showing the two things that the FDA need to approve safety and efficacy. Does it work and is it not going to, you know, harm people? I would imagine that could be approved in two years. Psilocybin for treating depression is uh, just a little bit behind that, I think. So maybe three, four years away from psilocybin being approved for depression. The huge caveat is, of course, you know, it depends on the results of that phase three work. I know these aren't your studies, but the depression studies and the MDMA studies for PTSD – do you know what the success rate generally has been and, and how do they compare to standard treatments? All of these treatments have shown pretty large effects. There's some variability across studies, but with the large majority of people, whether it's on PTSD or depression, you know, six months later, very large portions are seeing substantial reductions in, in their symptoms. Uh, so the majority in, in, in various studies showing that they don't even meet the criteria for having a disorder anymore. 
and, and then others, you know, having substantial reduction. So they're fairly large effects in terms of the treatment of these disorders. So let's say someone is listening right now and they suffer from depression or PTSD and they hear this and think, okay, wow, I'm just going to go out and take a whole lot of mushrooms. Do you worry about that? I'm not encouraging people based on the research to do it on their own. For one reason, because we've done these things under really specific conditions. You know, we're screening out people that might have some increased risk factor. We are monitoring people. Um, we're preparing them. And so all that is likely to be very different. I've done surveys of thousands of people at this point that have taken these drugs that say they just took it for fun and they stopped smoking or stopped drinking or stopped doing cocaine, this type of thing. That it really appears to happen too, but it certainly seems like once chances of success, we have no idea how to gauge it. They're, they're certainly lower without that professional help. And the, on the other side, in terms of risk, yeah, there are very real risks. Can you talk about those? Yeah, so it depends on what compound we're talking about. With MDMA, it's more likely for there to be a, a straight-up medical risk, so a cardiovascular problem. It has stimulant properties. It is also possible for people to have heart problems. We weed up for psilocybin, so we exclude people that have severe heart disease, the type of person that they could have a heart attack shoveling snow and going up flights of stairs. But MDMA is even more of a concern. So those are all things you can screen for and you can test in a very rigorous way. But then also on the psychiatric side, it appears over the decades of observation that people with either active psychotic disorders like schizophrenia or a predisposition for having those disorders, it appears that those people can be destabilized with a psychedelic experience. And I think of it the same way that you know, their disease state you know, can be triggered or exacerbated by any number of intense, potentially traumatic life events. How common is it for people in the studies to have a bad trip? Oh, yeah. So it happens on about a, a, a third of the sessions. So in the research, we call them challenging experiences because the really bad thing that can happen when someone's when this happens on their own is not that they're feeling anxiety. It's that they run across the street because they, they're freaking out and they get hit by a car. That's an example. It's rare, but it has happened. People you know, are highly intoxicated and they do something and they get hurt. Or they get arrested because they just go out and make a fool of themselves in public and this type of thing. Now, someone could have you know, one of the most uh, kind of fearful experiences of their life. But in the context of having been prepared for that, having a trusted person there to hold their hand and to reassure them that they're not being left alone, we haven't seen any long-term evidence of harms that have come from it. Some people say they wouldn't want to do it again. Um, but we've never seen any anybody that claims that they've been long-term harmed from it. A lot of people say that they actually valued, even though we do our best to minimize them, they actually value those difficult experiences. They vary, but sometimes it has to do with you know looking at yourself in a difficult way, um, you know facing your demons, this type of thing, or just kind of going through this kind of existential fear and persevering, having some faith that it's going to be okay, and getting through the other side. You know, running that gauntlet seems to make someone feel like they've gone through something, a rite of passage. You know, in a sense, it seems like the train is out of the station already when it comes to commercialization, the road to either legalization or just decriminalization. So what do you picture, you know, as a kind of ideal future pathway for all of this to come out well and minimizing harm? What do you think needs to happen? I think we need to continue the federal funding of research. We are in the in the age where there's a, a lot of uh, investment now in terms of companies looking towards FDA approval. I think overall it's a good that's a good thing, but we do need that basis of federally funded research that you know really across science often forms the basis, and it's the area where you're more likely to have more kind of rigorous work to address safety factors, kind of at a more fundamental level and learn something about these drugs and how to appropriately shepherd them into the future. We also need more public information. Yes, this is promising, but yes, there are risks, you know, and so informing the public. I do think that there is more of a, a role for, for you know, local, state, and the federal government in terms of really not from kind of a, a scared, straight uh, sort of uh, kind of extremist position, but realistically, 
you know, kind of let people know, yeah, you've probably heard about these things. Maybe you're interested. And there is some research. Here's where the the state of the evidence is. And, and, and here is what we know about the risks of these in the human animal. What do you think of microdosing? That seems to have come into uh, fashion. I feel like I hear and read about people doing it all the time. There's no evidence to date that it's actually having the therapeutic effects that are claimed. It's possible, but if it is working, in other words, causing, you know, these therapeutic effects, and there's various claims, you know, from antidepressant effects to PTSD treatment, improving focus, this type of thing. You know, if if there is an effect there, it's a much different model than the psychedelic therapy I've been describing with high doses. Well, we're undoubtedly going to be hearing a lot more about that. But I'm eager to know what's next for you and what are you most excited about on the horizon in, in your own research or in other people's research and what you see coming down the pike? I guess in the big picture, I'm looking forward to figuring out and, and as a field, us all figuring out what are the common elements linking together these different disorders. One of the big picture amazing things with the psychedelic work is that they seem to be working for really distinct disorders. And so I think the backdrop of that is psychedelics as a tool to help teach us the nature of these disorders. Maybe there's more in common between addiction and depression than we normally um, acknowledged um, because we're seeing this transdiagnostic efficacy. In other words, it's working for these apparently separate disorders. So the more we learn about the long-term effects of it in the brain, the closer we're going to get to actually understanding more about the nature of these disorders, period. That's such an interesting way to think about psychedelic research and really all research into disorders like depression and addiction, these diseases that are just so hard to treat in the brain. And I guess it also perfectly sums up what we need in the future. I can't wait to learn what you find. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation. The World As You'll Know It is brought to you by Aventine, a nonprofit research institute creating and sharing work that explores how today's decisions could affect the future. The views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of Aventine, its employees, or affiliates. For a transcript of the episode and more resources related to what you've heard in today's episode, please visit us at aventine.org slash podcast. Danielle Mattoon is the editorial director of Aventine. The World As You'll Know It is produced in partnership with Pineapple Street Studios. Our associate producer is Yinka Rickford Angwin. Our producers are Sophia steinert Evoy and Stephen Key. Our senior editor is Joel Lovell. This episode was mixed by Davey Sumner, and I'm your host, Judith Warner. Original music by Hannes Brown. Legal services for Pineapple Street by Bianca Grimshaw at Granderson Des Rochers. Our executive producers are Jayanne Berry, Jenna Weiss Berman, and Max Linsky. Make sure to listen on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. This was our last episode. Thanks so much for listening.